pick antivirus that month. Um, I think it's similar in reason a lot of researchers pick antivirus. It's, of course, um, many components operating with high privileges. Uh, there's also a large attack surface with antivirus, such as um, especially in handling some untrusted low privilege data for like file scanning and uh, parsing. Of course, got a good use of IPC networking and nearly always a kernel driver involved. And the last one I call organization ubiquity, which is really just a fancy way of saying, well, per organization, antivirus is rolled out org-wide. So if you find a vulnerability in this application, you just made 100% of their machines vulnerable, as opposed to finding a vulnerability in the software that might be only used by a subset of the uh, corporation. And so going over our talk outline, we'll first get into familiarization of Komodo, just generally what it is. Uh, then we'll dive a little deeper into reverse engineering uh, the various components and how it works. Once we get a good knowledge base there, we'll be exploring the attack surface available to us as an attacker. From there, we'll be creating an attack vector. Uh, we might run into some snags, so we'll have to bypass security measures. And then finally, go over the actual exploitation and POC. So first, familiarization. Uh, Komodo antivirus, what is it? It's your typical antivirus. It's agent-based, so processes are actually running on the, uh, the client machine with, along with the virus definition database. Uh, features, your typical features, firewall, file scanning, of course. Uh, but then also one that might not be an all antivirus, such as called process containment. And process containment is, uh, I'll use it synonymous with sandboxing in this talk, just a way to run a process in a safe uh, environment so that it doesn't actually make changes or malicious of, maliciously affect your real operating system. So running it in a safe runtime, if you will. And uh, it also has consumer as well as enterprise presence. And the volumes we'll talk about here uh, affect both lines of product, enterprise as well as the uh, consumer uh, versions. Uh, it's made of five main modules. So we got five processes here. Uh, primary control agent, this is the main antivirus agent. Then we have a kernel mode filter driver called CMD guard sys that interrupts all file IO. Uh, file scanning service, CAVWP. RPC interception, we'll get into that a little bit later, called CMD vers EXE. And the last process, that's, you know, mat last module here is a user GUI interface, sys EXE. And these ones in red here are ones that run in high privileges, such as system or kernel mode. So you can see quite a bit of attack service here. We've got five different processes, kernel drivers to start attacking uh, and perhaps gain privilege. So very cool. Um, and when I first researched Komodo, what I'm dealing with, I ran into this, which is from their website. And they're explaining they use something called RTAC called Runtime uh, Automatic Threat Containment. And what it is, I highlighted the part that was uh, of interest, it's RTAC is intelligent enough to weed out the good and bad and contain only the unknown, hence creating a very efficient containment technology. And what this really means is that with the default settings in antivirus, uh, when a user runs a file and that file is unknown, it's gonna by default sandbox that process. So I realized if I wanna make a feasible exploit here, I'm gonna have to first figure out a way to, uh, to escape the sandbox to actually do the uh, rest of the exploitation. So that was my first target. Um, in fact, we have a video here just demoing like what the sandbox looks like when a user uses it. Um, here I'm gonna run command prompt in the Komodo container. And down below, we have two folders. Uh, on the lower left is the folder, the current working directory I'm gonna try to write a file to as a sandbox process. And on the lower right is where the file will actually write to, which is the sandbox folder where it diverts all that I.O. request. And here I go, I'm trying to write a file to the desktop. And we don't see it appear on the lower left where we expect it. Instead, it gets diverted to this lower right folder that we have open, and which is called uh, under VT root. It's just a place where all sandbox writes go to. So that, that's just uh, showing kind of the, uh, the I.O. nature of how the uh, sandbox behavior works. Okay, let's get a little deeper into the uh, actual inner workings. Um, so I spent a couple days reverse engineering the sandbox. I won't put you through that, but so I made, uh, I made this instead. And trying to uh, put in presenter mode. Um, so I made this instead. So this is actually what I uh, recreated out of reverse engineering the sandbox in this little schematic here that we can see. And in fact, we can actually uh, trace through, here, I'm gonna try to put this back into presentation mode. There we go. Uh, we can actually walk through uh, the command prompt example and talk about what was going on behind the scenes and how this was actually working. So up here in the top left, we can start here and explore. And I try to show its address space with some DLLs in here. We'll see one that's called guard64 DLL. That's a Komodo DLL. And the way it got there was because the, the Komodo uh, driver actually injects that DLL into the user mode process every time a process creation uh, starts. 
And what its job is is to hook several user mode APIs. And one of these APIs happens to be create process internal. So what was happening, when I, make, when I started command prompt, I made a sandbox process, the explorer called create process, and that call was hooked by guard64 DLL, sent a quick message down to this driver, the Komodo driver, and says sandbox this process I'm about to make. And so now the driver uh, has a linked list of all running processes, and it inserts this new process to its linked list and marks it as a sandbox process. And you can see it here, here's like process one, benign, process two, that one just inserted to uh, tell the driver to, to uh, contain it. And now the uh, create process call continues, creates my process, thread starts, and I'm live. This is command prompt now. And now next time I try to do file or reg IO, uh, we go through and the IO request goes through to the kernel, but the kernel mode filter driver intercepts all that request and it'll say, wait, who's making this IO request? Uh, are you a sandbox process? It looks it up in its list. It says, yes, you are. So it diverts its file I.O. To over here to these fake uh, folders and fake registry paths. And thus, we can't really affect the file system uh, when we're a sandbox process. Also worth mentioning, you know, CabWP, the scanning service. Uh, oh, you know what? That's just uh, Carbon Black telling me I have malware. Um, there. <laughs> uh, so we have CabWP, uh, which uh, also was just told to invoke a scan on this process. And last but not least, you'll see a line here that says ALPC RPC. Uh, what this is, is Komodo is actually also containing ALPC and RPC traffic. And if you're not familiar, ALPC is a Windows interprocess communication technology. Uh, from a sandbox standpoint, this can be quite dangerous if left unmonitored, because if you're familiar with WMI or anything like that, you know, you can create a process over WMI, which is going through over ALPC, telling the WMI host provider to create a process for you. And if that's not monitored, there you go. That's an easy escape right there. So Komodo's monitoring this ALPC, RPC traffic and diverting them to these fake SBC host instances they run so that the sandbox application can kind of interact slightly with ALPC, RPC requests and not break. Um, and that's generally uh, what's, what's going on here with the sandbox. So to go recap of what we have against us right now, we have completely blocked file registry IO as a sandbox process. We're unable to invoke sensitive RPC calls like WMI, like I just said. Uh, once a process is sandbox, it cannot be unsandboxed. So no feature existed that we could unsandbox ourselves with. I didn't see anything we could trick the user into clicking to say, hey, let us out of the sandbox or send a message somewhere. Uh, and it also disallowed DLL injection. So there goes technique of trying to code inject other processes on the machine to try to somehow get out. Okay, well, let's check out what attack surface we do have available to ourselves. So as a sandbox process, what do we have access to? We actually have access to the uh, CMD guard sys kernel driver, actually. And this is because guard64 DLL, which is injected into every process, part of its job when it hooks APIs is it monitors the usage and reports it to the driver uh, to let it know status updates of what the process is doing. And because guard64 DLL also has to inform sandbox processes updates, well, us as a sandbox process can also talk to the driver directly and send our own messages. So this is quite interesting. And in fact, Komodo tries to prevent this by uh, simply putting user mode hook when you try to connect to a filter driver in the kernel. But this is trivial to bypass, so bypass the hook, we got ourselves a little attack surface here. Uh, additional attack surface is most securable objects. So on Windows, securable objects are things like name pipes, uh, uh, mutexes, um, you know, uh, shared memory, et cetera. Uh, we can connect to most securable objects because, again, Komodo in a sandbox process is one of the few times it uses a user mode hook. So it's actually user mode hooking, trying to prevent you from connecting to securable objects on the operating system. But we can trivially bypass this hook and connect to these uh, securable objects given we have the right Windows permissions uh, for that object. And now this is cool, and, and you know, a sandbox escaping just through that is a whole other story, but it's at least something we can uh, connect to if we try. And going back to the first example here, we have CMD guard sys kernel driver interaction. It's just what I was talking about. We're a contained process, and we can interact with the Komodo driver called CMD guard sys through the uh, CMD auth port that it exposes. So first thing I found, I actually reverse engineered this message handler because I want to see how we can uh, attack it. And then, you know, I came across a few inter interesting things, and this is one of them, a, a handle type confusion. Uh, so CMD guard sys would accept handles sent from user mode but the driver would expect the handle to be a job object. And this is actually slightly dangerous here because they're calling a kernel mode API OB reference object by handle, but they're passing null for object type. And what that does is it means it'll accept any generic handle and convert it to whatever object it is without validation. 
And so what we could have done is that because it expects a job object, we could have sent a handle to a uh, process object or a handle to a thread object. And when this API is called, it'll end up resolving, un and mistakenly, resolving a process object instead of uh, the job object it expects. And now when it receives that process object, it's gonna try to interact with it like it was a job object and perhaps reference invalid fields, write to invalid parts, because it's a different object. So your basic type confusion issue here. Now, I did reverse engineer and try to see all the usages of this object, and unfortunately, nothing exploitable found. But just uh, at least, you know, some, some making some progress in this message handler. Next, I looked at uh, L LPC. So LPC is a Windows Interprocess Communication technology. Uh, it's the simple idea of a client that you can talk to a LPC server over LPC, LPC ports. Uh, it uses APIs like NT Connect port, NT Create port, uh, things like this. Um, this is a great attack vector as it, we can connect to it from a sandbox process. Uh, worth mentioning, it is deprecated. So Windows actually replaces since Vista with ALPC, Advanced Local Procedure Call. But Komodo actually uses this and we can connect to its exposed LPC port. And this L LPC port that it had was called a CMD VRT LPC server port. And like I said, from a sandbox process, we can connect to this and send it messages. So naturally, the next step I take is I want to reverse engineer now the LPC message handler and how we can exploit that. Uh, so this is like a little snippet of the uh, LPC message handler here. Um, we can see a part uh, where when it receives an LPC datagram right here, uh, code execution will divert to this red area, which I noticed was crashing. An LPC datagram is just your, generally just a, a message in L LPC. Uh, and it was crashing here. So next thing, I got all excited. I thought, oh man, did we just buck overflow this thing? So I wanted to look at why this service was crashing when we sent an LPC message. And we find it's because Komodo was placing a hard-coded null value for a memmove operation, which would instantly crash. So right when you send this message handler anything, you'll crash the service because they hard-coded a null for a memmove. And you know, basically writing up, you know, following code like this uh, from a sandbox process, we're connecting to this L LPC port, sending a message, and as expected, we completely crash that service. Now, this is, you know, just a dial service, so we report it, you know, nothing really like we can do anything with it. But actually what was cool about this CVE was that it actually opened up more kernel attack service. And that's because Maybe in the diagram I showed earlier, might not have seen this part, but CMD vert, which is a service, can talk to an entirely different port that the driver exposes called CMD service port. And no, normally nobody can connect to this port. And that's because when the kernel create, when the uh, Komodo driver creates this port, it sets its max connection to one. And so when Windows boots, the service starts, instantly connects to that kernel port. The port's occupied, max connection hit, by the time the user logs in and processes actually start running, well, the max connection's uh, at one and no one else can connect to this privileged port. So what we just did though was the fact that we can crash that service means we just lowered its connection count to zero, which means we can connect to it now ourselves. And so that's exactly what we do. We go ahead from a sandbox, crash this process, take over that port. Now we have a little bit more attack surface to work with. So now I reverse engineer this message handler and while I didn't find anything like cool, like a privilege, uh, privilege instructions I could send, I did find a little memory corruption issue where uh, what I noticed is that I use weak probe for read, probe for write checks. And so in um, when drivers, there'll be APIs called probe for read, probe for write. And what they do is they validate buffers coming from user mode that they actually do reside in user mode memory. And this is important because when a driver receives a buffer from user mode, what they don't want to happen is the driver to receive a kernel mode address and the driver accepts it, starts reading, writing to it, and little as it know, it just kernel exploited itself. So there needs to be protections in place where the drivers do a probe for read, probe for write when buffers come from an untrusted source to make sure that that memory, the buffer and the range of it all resides within user mode memory. And the reason it was weak, the way they're using it is when they call probe for read in the driver, when I send a message to this routine, they would use the size that I said the buffer was. And normally that's okay, but what happened was when I send the, my buffer and the size of it to the driver, it'll say, it'll pass. However, Komodo will blindly just write a thousand more bytes to that buffer. And they didn't actually check the buffer size themselves. They just let probe for read uh, do it. And I'm hoping uh, this next example will clear it up. So here's Komodo actually blindly, soon after that probe for write check, 
just mem sets, uh, you know, hex 734 bytes to my buffer I pass from user mode. And way we can uh, corrupt this is by writing code something like this. So we can allocate a uh, memory buffer near the end of our user mode memory range. Then we will uh, push that buffer up more, so we only give it hex 20 bytes of slack space before we hit the very end of our user mode memory range. And then we go ahead and pass that buffer to the driver, and we tell the driver the buffer size is only 8 bytes. And what will happen is pro for write will receive that, and it'll say, okay, we got a buffer from user mode. It says 8 bytes. Yep, that all resides within user mode memory. Barely, but it does. And as it goes down to the driver to get handled, Komodo will blindly write 1,000 more bytes to it, spilling past our user mode memory range. And we get a nice BSOD from a sandbox. And this is, uh, you know, pretty cool. I mean, we got this, <laughs> every time I present this, I keep seeing my computer crash when I'm like at home, but um, we have, uh, yeah, CMD guards, sys, uh, system service exception. Um, this is pretty cool, but there's actually not really anything we do with this because, as you may know, on 64-bit OSs, at least, we have an enormous amount of dead space between user mode memory and kernel mode memory. If this was x86, we could have wrote past user mode memory and affected kernel mode memory, right, you know, like that. But in x64, it's an enormous amount of, uh, you know, dead man space. So spilling over it is just a typical seg fault, really. Uh, so once Windows supports 16 exabytes of memory or whatever, then this vulnerability will be actually used. Um, so again, we just report that typical BSOD. Uh, next, look at, there's a shared memory uh, uh, issue going on here, too. So CMD agent, which is the main antivirus executable, uh, is exposing a sh piece of shared memory, and if we check the permissions of this shared memory, it's writable by everyone. And as I mentioned before, we can connect the securable objects as a sandbox process, given we bypass our own user mode hook. And uh, go ahead and look at what, share what this shared memory is that CMD agent is exposing. And we see the contents looks like this, and when I reverse engineer the antivirus and see what, what data they're writing out to this memory, you know, shared memory object, and I find out it's the contents of an entire C++ object. They're just writing to shared memory that anyone else can write to themselves. And off the bat, I actually looked a little deeper. More specifically, they call it a shared memory dict. That's the class that they're writing. And here I outline the key value length fields um, of that structure. And we can actually instantly create an out-of-bounds read here if we just write really large values to these key value lengths so that next time Komodo tries to read this from this object, this shared memory dictionary, it's going to end up reading, like, think the string is like 10,000 bytes, read past the memory segment, and seg fault. And, uh, of course, this is what this following code does here, uh, one of the CV3972. Um, you'll notice this first function called repair NTDLL. That's just undoing the user mode hooks they put in me as a sandbox, connecting the shared memory, and we write a bunch of Fs. And next time, Komodo reads from that shared memory, which is constantly, it's constantly reading. It just instantly crashes. And so now what we have, we have a full on, like, we just crippled, killed antivirus in the sandbox. Like, there is no more scanning. There is no more uh, sandboxing if we create a new process. It's, it's, it's over now. Um, but it's worth mentioning that uh, if the user had HIPS enabled, which is an additional security feature in Komodo that's not default, this would not be possible. And also, I wasn't here to just break antivirus. I was here to actually exploit through it and do something uh, maybe more uh, treacherous. So that leads us into calm. And COM is where the rest of this attack service will be talking about. Uh, it stands for Component Object Model. And I'm going to try to let MSDN do a little explanation of what this is. So COM is a platform-independent, distributed, object-oriented system for creating binary software components that can interact. And basically, you have this concept of a client, COM client and a COM server. And they can be two separate compiled modules, yet they can interact with each other, like such as instantiate objects of one another, call methods on that object. And um, it's also worth mentioning that these client-server relationships, they can be a DLL you load in your process. That could be considered a COM server. So you're actually just interacting with a DLL through COM and you know, uh, basically just accomplishing a COM interaction. But from a security standpoint, that's not really interesting. There's no privilege boundary being crossed. If you exploit the COM server and it's a DLL in your process, I mean, who cares? You're running as your same privilege that you currently are. The second type of COM you'll come across called uh, inter like outer proc COM, and this will actually be a separate EXE running on your system that will be a COM server that you can remotely interact with and invoke and create objects in its address space, call methods on them, and this is called outer proc COM. This is much more interesting from an uh, exploitation perspective because now we can uh, actually cross privilege boundaries. 
Uh, so I got on this whole comp kick because I saw this process called uh, SysEXE, which is a low privilege Komodo client. It's got this GUI interface. You can scan. You can change settings. Um, clearly, there's some communication vector that it's communicating these high privilege agents to tell it to do things. So that was one little evidence there. And there was also the context shell menu handler in Windows. So in Komodo, when you right click on a file, it can just you can also scan that file with Komodo antivirus. So clearly, that's another instance where it must be getting the string for that file, passing it somewhere, and telling some privileged agent to scan it. Like there must be some uh, communication going on there. So to figure out this communication, I went ahead and uh, reverse engineered Cap Shell DLL, the, the contact menu handler, and I wanted to see how it's communicating to the main antivirus agent. And right here, I found like everything I needed to see. Uh, here you'll see a call to something called uh, go get class object. It's a com method. Uh, what this does is it's actually requesting um, an interface to a class ID to create an object instance in this com server. And right when we see this, we got up some good information we can work off of. Because right here, we see something called CLS ID SysGate. That's the class ID they're passing this API. And if we look up this class ID in the registry, we'll find instantly who the comp server is, who are they trying to talk to and create an object in. So we go ahead and do that. Uh, here we go. We find it in the registry. Um, in fact, we see a beautiful thing here. It says local server 32. So when I was talking about there's two main types of comm, like in process, out of proc. Local server 32 is an out of proc comm server. And even more interesting, if we see who that out of, out of proc comm server is, it's CMD agent, the one running a system. And so here we have a model of a low privilege comm client such as SysEXE remotely interacting with this CMD agent running a system over COM, again, over RPC, uh, to invoke these uh, methods and, um, and functionality. And so you can imagine if you're a developer and you're writing a COM server that's out of proc, you got to be really careful how you write that, because you're exposing yourself to um, low privilege COM clients that do particularly, you know, potentially invoke sensitive methods in your uh, address space. So, Naturally, a lot of the way, time you see this, they make those precautions and they write them carefully, but we're still going to push through and find the mistakes they make. And that gets into, now that we have an attack service to work off of, we're going to create an attack vector. And for this, I just went ahead and reverse engineered the comm client and wrote my own comm client to mimic what Komodo was actually doing. And on the left here is just a V table uh, I extracted from the comm server. And this is important because I'm just right, getting the method like signatures so I know how to interact with the stubs from our, my comm client. And on the right, it's just the boilerplate code of um, setting up a comm uh, relationship. So here I'm, I'm asking for an interface to a class factory where I can create an fa instance of that object in their, um, the comm server. And then I'm uh, eventually calling the scan file method, which is the, off the uh, correct offset to tell Komodo to say, hey, here's a string, now scan this file. So I wrote this exactly the way I reverse engineered it from the Komodo client. However, when I got to this line, when I actually asked to create an instance of the object in the comm server, I would get an access denied return. And that bummed me out for a couple minutes, but then I started thinking, well, yeah, I'm sandbox, but it still doesn't make sense because I didn't see, when I reverse engineered in the sandbox, I didn't see anything interacting or manipulating comm interactions. I didn't see anything blocking that. And the other reason was, OK, I'm running the same, as far as Windows is concerned, I'm running the same privileges as SysEXE and ExploreEXE, and they can get away with these calls. So why can't I? Why am I getting access denied? And so instead of giving up, I wanted to push forward and see what was actually going on. And this now involved debugging the main comm server, CMD agent. We now want to see what's happening. When we ask to create an instance of an object in this comm server, why is it, why is it failing? What's going on? And we find that it actually wasn't Windows giving us access denied error code. It was Komodo themselves. In fact, here it is. We put it through WinDebug. We found the spot right where we're about to instantiate an object in, its, uh, in the comm server. And right here, we see the access denied error code uh, at the bottom. And it was returning that because whatever this function was up top was returning 0. And it's as simple as we just need to figure out what this function is and how to get it to return non-zero. Well, when I reverse engineered this function, I found that it was a comm signature check. So they're actually making sure that comm clients that connect to them are, must be cryptographically signed by either Microsoft or Komodo themselves. And this is a pretty good protection. I mean, you know, like I said before, comm servers are sensitive. So they want to make sure that, 
hey, you got to be uh, legit to talk to me. And this makes sense, too, because the only comp clients they expect to talk to this server is either Explorer EXE, which is signed by Microsoft, or Sys EXE, which is signed by Komodo. And anyone else, your access denied. Well, I want to push forward and see how if we can find mistakes in the signature check. And this involves, gets into uh, bypassing the security methods. Uh, I took apart the part where they're doing the signature check, the comm server. So now this is actually the comm server and how it's validating the comm client connecting to it that it's cryptographically signed. And we pretty much find a mistake in the signature checking code. So this is the code leading up to where they're trying to extract the um, file name, file path of the comm client and passing it to a signature check that checks it on disk. And I don't know if anybody maybe sees anything wrong with this code. It might be hard to see actually. And, um, I, uh, but in short, here's, here's what's happening. Um, the server is obtaining the comm client's process ID in a valid way. So when the comm client connects to it, comm server checks the, uh, the PID of the comm client. With the PID, it looks up uh, um, the process name by call, eventually calling it to git module file name ex. And now it resolves the comm client's full path. And with that full path, it now passes it to a signature validation uh, function where it checks the uh, cryptographic uh, signature on disk. And the problem here, I mean, one problem is that they're using git module file name ex. And if you know how this API works, it actually queries uh, the remote processes PEB. And a PEB is a process environment block. And this exists in my process as a comm client. So really what's happening is like when I text the server, it's asking my own PEB, which is in my address space, what my name is. So right there we can actually just overwrite our own PEB with a different process path, and we can fool it into checking their signature for the wrong binary. And that's one method, and we'll list it here. So if we just spoof PEB loader in memory order module list, that's where that string will be. We can just change our process name. We'll just change it to like we're you know, SVC host, and I'll check it, and we're assigned by Microsoft, and, and now we just uh, got past the signature check. Additional method could be process hollowing a actual Komodo or Microsoft binary. And I actually opted for the second method because it gave us an additional benefit that uh, maybe I'll get into later. But um, process hollowing, if you don't know, is the act of where you start a legit process on the computer, you uh, yank out all of its code, and instead insert your own code in there and resume the thread. And so now you have this like process that wasn't meant to run this code you just put in it running and everything like looks legit. And that's exactly what I decided to do. So I wrote a process hollower a couple nights and we now have something that looks like this. We have a uh, our contained process. We create an instance of the actual Komodo binary from program files, uh, CMD verse. And yeah, it's worth mentioning, this process I just created is sandbox as well, but that doesn't matter. Um, what we do is we yank out all of its code. All that comm code that wasn't working, we just shoved it into this new process we made, that's the Kom Komodo one. We resume the thread, and now what's gonna happen is that we're going to make this Komodo process hold it hostage and do requests for us. And right when we do it that way, we instantly get a scan to happen on the machine. So this is cool. This means that we just, uh, you know, now communicating with this privileged comm server. And while this is cool, we're clearly not going to like scan our way out of this sandbox or do anything cool. But we just open up a pretty awesome attack surface, and we assume there's more functions than just scan we can hit. So into exploitation and uh, POC. Um, so how do you go about this now? Uh, I went ahead and looked at the V table we're hitting. So when we're a comm client, we're creating an object in the comm server. And with that, we get an interface back, which is an interface to a bunch of functions we can hit from a comm client. And right here, we reverse engineered the, uh, uh, just some of the uh, comm server. And this is the V table we can interact. These are all the functions we can hit as a low privilege comm client. And I looked through a bunch of these, and unfortunately, they seem pretty secure, actually, the way they wrote them. Uh, they did, I couldn't find any memory corruption issues. I passed like bad data, et cetera, the various ones. Uh, it seemed pretty solid there. And also, they had a good usage of co-impersonate client. So co-impersonate client is an API used. Uh, typically, you'll see it in services, so that when a client, when a low privilege process asks a privileged service to do something for it, like, hey, read a file for me, they'll call co-impersonate client to emulate, impersonate the privileges of that client asking for the job to be done. And that's important because you don't want the service to say, hey, read this file for me. As system, it just reads the file and gives the data back. 
right? He needs to uh, say, okay, I'll read that file, but I'm going to act like I'm you with your permissions and do it for you so that you can't exploit my power, basically. And we try to look for bugs in involving that. Uh, yeah, they use co impersonate client quite a bit, and they use it in a good manner. Every time they're about to do something privileged, they call this. So nothing we could affect necessarily there. But it's not over because with a com client, with, I'm sorry, with a com object, uh, typically supports multiple interfaces. So right now, well, the way we had our code, we just asked for one interface of that com object. There's other interfaces we can look at. And how do we know new interfaces we can ask for? Uh, there's probably easier ways, but the way I did it was I just opened up the com server again. There's a function called query interface that all com clients will inherit, well, one of the methods they'll inherit are called query interface. And what this is, is um, when the com client asks for an interface to an object, the com server has to check itself against all of the supported interface IDs to say, do I even support this interface that they're asking for? So one quick way to find all supported interface for a com server, reverse engineer this query interface function that they have to call into and unroll the array of uh, interface IDs that they iterate over to check if they're supported. And here we find those right here in the com server. We see the top one, or we see the middle one, IID, ISIS, facade. That was one we just looked at that didn't really have a whole lot. That was that V table, that list of functions. Um, but this top one here, IID service provider, looked kind of interesting. And in fact, if we look up uh, MSDM, what this I service provider does, it says the I service provider interface has only one member, query service, through which a caller specifies the service ID. So super generic sounding, and that's kind of good because what I got from that is uh, it's an application defined com object basically. It's like it's just a way to ask if you want to make a service as a custom, you just wrap it with this query service, and you can ask for it if you know the right service ID to ask for that the comp server made. And I did find one of the uh, service IDs that they support that they made themselves. It's called ISPC registry access. And now we get some cooler attack surface. We have a whole new uh, list of functions we can hit now as a low privilege comp client. And we see methods uh, that do registry key reads without doing a co-impersonate client, which remember, that means that now they're reading registries as system for you and giving that data back. So right now we have a way to read privilege reg registry keys that are like typically supposed to be blocked, you know. Um, but I was more interested, are there methods that write registry keys? And knowing how people make classes, you usually don't make only getters. You usually like, kind of bounce it out with setters, you know? So that was kind of some hunch to that they're doing some registry writes. And of course, yes, the answer is yes. Here's a registry write right here. One of the methods, you'll see there's no co-impersonate client called before this. It's just write, gets right to the action with the data that it passed, writes a registry key, and returns. So here's the plan now with all this that we have. We, from a sandbox, hollow a Komodo, uh, signed Komodo binary and replace it with our malicious com client code to bypass the signature check. With our com client, obtains an interface to ISIS class factory. And with ISIS class factory, we instantiate an instance of iService provider in CMD agent exe. Uh, our com client now queries iService provider for an interface to ISVC registry access. With ISPC registry access, comp client resolves an ISPC reg key interface. And now that we have an ISPC reg key interface, we can call a special method, which will obtain a writable reg key interface for a given registry key. Finally, we invoke com methods in CMD agent to actually just do that right, the registry right. And here, you know, some of the code that does that. Um, here, we're uh, for our what we're going to try out. We're querying the service for ISPC reg key. We end up asking for the writable reg handle interface, and we remotely invoke a registry write com method in CMD agent. And so this was all reverse engineered from the comp server and how, you know, knowing how to interact with it um, from our low privileged uh, state. So we do that, and boom, success. We actually just overwrote the VSS service, uh, its image path. So next time Windows reboots now, it's gonna try to start whatever image path I wrote here as system service instead of the original VSS service. And that's pretty cool. I mean, like, you know, after reboot to escalate the system. But I found a uh, better way. I realized if we chain it with CVE 2019-3972, we can instantly escalate the system. And that's because this is the one that crashes CMD agent. So what we can do now is we can write a new CMD agent, uh, new executable path in CMD agent in the registry. We'll crash CMD agent from our sandbox using that um, share memory uh, vulnerability. 
The service will try to be revived because it's a sticky service, but it'll revive the wrong one because we just wrote a new image path and Windows will, revive, will start us as system instead of the actual Komodo agent. And we'll have something that now looks like this. And uh, if you don't believe my Photoshop skills, uh, well, I have a video demonstration for the POC. So here I am, uh, this is Komodo antivirus version 12. And we go ahead and uh, this is a registry showing, um, yeah, HK local machine hive, protected, admin only. And we go ahead and start the POC as a sam in sandbox mode. So this is our POC is running under the Komodo sandbox. Uh, we copy the executable path of the image I want to replace C of the agent with. And it's just a who am I executable. Boom, we wrote, we exp we wrote it. Now we just told CMD basically to, we just invoked the registry write a system there. And now we're just going to remotely crash this service uh, CMD agent. We just killed it. Windows tries to revive the service again and it's us, system, as system. And so uh, that's, uh, that's basically it. Like we have a POC release. It actually has all these uh, CDs in it from Komodo that you can uh, play with. Um, Here's a gentleman on the right, actually on Twitter. Uh, he popped Calcus system on his machine when he saw this come out. So everything works. It's always nice we write POCs and actually work on other people's machines. Um, so yeah, happy uh, happy customer there. And uh, recovering, uh, going over the disclosure summary. We of course uh, disclose these bugs to the vendors when we find them. And with Komodo's case, this is a summary of what happened. Uh, they, they told us that it was uh, patched in version 12.0.0.6882. However, we found when we looked ourselves, it looked like they only stopped it happening from a sandbox process. If you find another sandbox escape, or if you just happen to not be a sandbox process, you, this vulnerability still exists. So to my knowledge, it seems like it's very much half alive in Komodo today. And since we just got extra time, I got one more uh, to go over that I found. Um, this was the actual AV signature database. Um, we found that, of course, on disk, it's protected. Only admin can write uh, to this signature database, and that's good, because you don't want people making your own AV signatures and bypassing or whatever. Uh, and what the mistake they make is they, when they load in this signature database, they read it in as a file mapping object, and that file mapping object has zero ACLs on it, which means that we can remotely write to this file mapping object and modify AV signatures in the actual system process. And the cool uh, things you can do here is, of course, you can just, like, here's an example of, like, how it looks for malicious scripts. And, like, these are updated all the time by new signatures they get. And, like, it's saying, like, uh, oh, you know, we'll delete this file if it contains this. Oh, or we'll also delete if it contains that. That's just one of these. We can write to it. We can zero it all out and basically just bypass and drop malicious files. But maybe more interesting is that you can actually use an arbitrary file delete with this because what I found is that if you make the signatures null, Komodo will just make think everything's evil and delete everything on your uh, system as, as system. So everything just starts to get quarantined. Uh, but this uh, one thing, it has to be a not assigned file. But like that's like all your manifests, all your XML files, like just everything's going to be quarantined. Like it's, it just goes on a rampage um, and just deletes everything. So that's uh, that's that, that's it. That's uh, that was uh, the uh, research we did. And uh, thanks for attending, guys. Absolutely. So, uh, and then any questions? Oh yeah, yeah. So the benefit was um, kind of interesting. In the kernel, they register a uh, process creation notify callback routine, and what they would do is they'd say they did a more strict check with the process. They actually said if the process is literally like from the get go, C program files vert CMD vert DXE, we'll do something special with it. And normally that's not hittable. If you start your process normal and try to change your PEB later, you already missed that opportunity. But if you process hollow, you'll actually be able to fool that kernel check as well. And what the benefit was is the kernel will actually skip the DLL injection of um, the hook hooking DLL. So it just will say, it'll ignore you. It'll say, oh, you're trusted. We're not going to put a we're not going to put a user mode hook in you. And so that makes this whole process easier to work with. And uh, there's also actually there's also another weird thing. They actually also check if your name is. Uh, if you're in a folder of system32 and your name is winInitExe, they just won't sandbox you. So you could just make a desktop system32 folder, winInitExe, and start it. And again, yeah, it wouldn't, wouldn't sandbox you. But. Yeah, actually, it's one I wrote. Um, 
Yeah, um, that I use, and uh, yeah, I can point you to it afterwards if you want to play with it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, from analyzing malware so much, you start to yeah get the hang of what they're doing. Yeah. Any anything else? All right. Awesome. Thanks for coming, guys.